three long range facility plan open houses. We are um, very glad that you are here and thank you for joining us. We have um, several panelists here who are going to be presenting to you tonight and they will introduce themselves in a good uh, turn. But my name is Stephen Sparks. I'm the Executive Administrator for Long Range Planning with the Beaverton School District. We have a lot of materials uh, to share with you today and so we'll be doing a lot of talking, but we do have built into this um, time for your questions and we hope to have a really good and robust dialogue with you as uh, we, we have opportunities during this presentation. We hope that you find this uh, interesting and will be uh, stimulating to uh, drive that discussion. Before we get started, I wanted to uh, um, share with you the uh, expectations that we have for all participants, including the panel, for uh, this meeting to, uh, tonight. We assume best intentions of everyone. We all want the best for all of our students. We listen intently to understand better. We are open to considering new ideas. There are no bad questions. Our interactions will be done with respect and we will respect opposing viewpoints. There are many important issues facing the district right now, not the least of which is the return to school of students and staff. Tonight, we're discussing the district's future facility needs. This meeting is not the time to discuss the important matters before the district, including return to uh, school for our students. We request today, therefore, that you keep your comments and your questions focused on the materials presented to you today. So, Mr. Landers here will lead the presentation and um, talk about what we're going to achieve here tonight. So, uh, Mr. Landers, I turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to welcome all of our attendees uh, to the presentation and just echo what Steve said uh, and thank you uh, for taking the time out of your busy day and evening uh, to attend this session to learn a little bit about uh, long range facility planning and the district's facilities. We know that there are a lot of other things that um, are pulling on your time demands and uh, we really appreciate you coming here. Um, again, uh, this discussion is really focused on development of a long range facility plan. Uh, and so we'll be talking about very specifically uh, how uh, the district's buildings and their sites uh, can better support education and the children in your community. That's really what the bottom line is because we recognize, and I'm sure you do too, that uh, the district and your community don't build school buildings for fun and just something to do. And you don't modernize them just for fun. You do that very specifically uh, to better support learning in your community. Uh, so with that, let's go to our agenda for this evening. Next slide, thank you. We'll open with just a brief um, introduction uh, to our planning team, followed by um, a high overview summary of what a long range facility plan actually is, what its intentions are, and what some of the key components are in a plan. Um, that will be followed by uh, a summary of strategic district goals, district wide goals as they relate to learning. And also uh, included in that will be a discussion, a brief discussion of your recent bond history, primarily focused on your last bond. Um, after that, we dive right into kind of one of the core pieces of the presentation this evening, which is really a discussion or presentation about district need as it relates to uh, facilities. And hopefully you'll be able to get an understanding of where certain improvements may or may not be warranted um, given the need that we present to you this evening. After that, 
section of the presentation will allow about a 10 minute period or so for any questions you might have regarding what you've seen, uh, the presentation of need. So what I would ask is that um, while we're going through the presentation to uh, think of the questions you might have or might want to ask us, but hold those questions until that 10 minute sec section. And at that time, I'll explain to you uh, a couple of different ways that you can ask your questions of us, um, chat versus uh, audible. So I'll cover that at that point in time. We'll then dive into after that question and answer period, um, the presentation of the current plan proposals themselves. We have two of them this evening for you to look at, consider, and that will be followed by about a 20 minute uh, question and answer discussion where we hope to learn um, from you to gather some of your insights regarding the, the plan proposals um, and, uh, and if there are some changes that you may suggest, we would certainly be very open to uh, hearing those. Um, and then that question and answer period would be, will be followed by a very brief six question um, kind of community poll, so to speak. And uh, we'll give you directions uh, on how that will be conducted at that point in time. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so for this evening, we have three key goals. The first goal is to give you an understanding of the district's facility related goals and needs. And this is really intended to serve as a solid background or foundation for the next goal, which is the presentation of the plan options. And our hope is that you can take a look at the plan options and think about them, consider them in light of the need areas that you would have seen to see how those plans are either um, directly supporting need or uh, providing better learning environments. And then the final goal, which is really our primary goal for this evening, is to hear back from you during these Q&A sessions and, community and discussion sessions regarding both the need and the plan options. Next slide. The planning team consists of me. My name is Leroy Landers. I'm a principal at Malem Architects and Jennifer Lubin, who is with us here today. She is a senior planner at Malem Architects. Frank Angelo with Angelo Planning Group is also a part of your consultant team. We have been working with a district leadership team uh, for probably about the last six months or so, eight months or so um, to uh, develop and summarize uh, the district need that you'll be seeing this evening and to also develop uh, several plan options that are really uh, intended to respond to uh, that need. Uh, a couple of those members are with us here this evening. So Steve Sparks is here. Um, Robert didn't, hasn't joined yet, I guess, correct? So um, the other uh, three leadership team um, had other um, responsibilities, other meetings than I'd actually for the district, so they couldn't be here. We've also been working with a 12 member community focus group. And at different points along the schedule, um, we have been meeting with that group to receive their input and adjust the plan as necessary based on some of the commentary that they've added uh, to, uh, to the discussion. Next slide. Tonight, um, we'd like you to keep in mind a few very important things. Firstly, that we are still definitely in the process of developing a plan here. What you're going to see is by no means uh, a finished product or the cake has not been baked. Um, we fully intend to hear from you and if there are comments that are really relevant and make sense uh, to really discuss the possibility of incorporating uh, that commentary into some plan adjustments. You all should know, should know that um, we may not be able to answer every question you have. It's not because we don't want to answer them. It may be outside of what we currently know. Um, we will certainly do our best to answer every question you have. Uh, and when we are unable to answer a question, we'll take that away, try and get an answer, and then get back to you if possible. Again, our primary uh, interest is to hear from you this evening. We will give you um, very specific points in time during the presentation for questions and comments. And ultimately, your feedback will be included in a report, which will be submitted to the superintendent for consideration 
uh, after the uh, superintendent has reviewed the report, um, he will then make recommendations to the school board regarding uh, the potential adoption of this long range facility plan. Um, and tonight, it's very important to remember that everything we're talking about in terms of possible projects or strategies uh, incorporated into the plan proposals are not a promise at this point in time. We're really just exploring possible ideas um, and hopefully we'll be getting your feedback. I would also wanna to mention too that this long range facility plan is really an update of several previous long range facility plans that have been developed by the district. And Frank uh, Angelo is gonna be talking a little bit about that in just a moment. Next slide. So Frank, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Lenore. Thank you for the introduction. Again, um, my name is Frank Angelo, Angelo Planning Group, and it's a pleasure to be a part of the, the planning team working with the district to develop the Long Range Facility Plan. What I'd like to do is give a brief summary and an overview of what uh, is a Long Range Facility Plan. Next slide, please. The long range facility plan really is an opportunity for the district to assess its educational programming in light of existing facilities, current facility conditions, facility opportunities, and then bring in a longer term look, a 10 year look uh, to identify facility needs for to, to uh, accommodate future enrollment and future educational programming within the district. The plan itself is a tool to uh, help the district strategically manage its programs, uh, facility programs, uh, to uh, support the education and success of all district students. As Leroy mentioned, the district has had long range facility plans in the past. Uh, there, uh, uh, a plan was prepared in 2002 in 2010. This is an update of the 2010 uh, long range facility plan. As well, there is a state uh, of Oregon uh, statute that guides long range facility planning for uh, school districts throughout the state of Oregon. ORS 195 identifies uh, the need for a 10 year plan for districts to prepare a 10 year plan. Uh, and it prescribes certain elements and certain uh, components of that plan, including looking at enrollment trends, uh, facility conditions, capital improvement needs, more efficient use of school sites uh, in school buildings, uh, and financing as well. Uh, again, it is a 10 year plan that's intended to identify the facility needs to support the educational programming of the district over that 10 year period. Next slide, please. Why now? Um, why do a long range facility plan now? Well, the, as I mentioned, the last uh, plan was adopted in 2010. So we're outside that 10 year planning horizon that the state uh, has prescribed for long range facility planning. And having a long range facility plan uh, makes the district eligible for uh, certain state funding opportunities for capital projects. So it's very important that the district update the plan to to understand its needs, know its needs and prioritize those needs and be able to compete for statewide capital funding. As well, uh, even given the, even in the pandemic condition, the district facilities continue to age and maintenance needs continue to grow. And Leroy will talk later about some of the age uh, issues associated with some of the facilities uh, in, in the district. The plan itself, as I mentioned, is an opportunity to identify efficiencies in district facilities. And it's important that we, the planning add an equity lens to facility planning to, to identify the need to identify opportunities for parity between schools, to, to identify any needed programs to enhance uh, equity uh, throughout the district. And then finally, the, it, the the long range facility plan is an opportunity to look ahead to the future for new capital programs uh, as current school bonds expire. The previous two long range facility plans, the 2000 and 20, 2002 and 2010 plans, both led to uh, capital improvement bonds being placed before the voters after adoption. 
the district is in a position in the next upcoming years where some uh, bonds will be paid back. So there will be some opportunities to look at future capital programs and Leroy will touch on those again in the future. Next slide, please. What should a long range, what should a plan consider? And there are really three categories of, of uh, features that the plan considers. I mentioned educational programming, educational specifications are the district's standards for size of school, how schools are used, uh, um, programs, additional programs such as kindergarten, physical education, special education, STEM, go into the educational programming discussion of the planning process and integrating technology into the future uh, facilities in the district. The second component is enrollment and capacity needs. Uh, the district, as many school districts do, works with Portland State University to identify 10-year uh, enrollment projections by grade level. So the district has a good feel for what kind of demand the uh, uh, future growth in the district will place on school facilities. So that's brought into the consideration and an identification of future needs. Facility condition is the, the third component. The district just continued in, uh, in 2020, just completed a very large uh, assessment of all their facilities, school facilities, as well as ancillary facilities, such as the bus, bus uh, uh, garages, administration buildings. So they have a very good handle now on the condition, the existing condition of, of existing facilities and what the needs are in those facilities. Next slide, please. And when you put all those three components together, that comes up with the long range facility plan that uh, Leroy mentioned, we will be taking and making recommendations to the superintendent and the superintendent will then take the recommendations uh, to his recommendation to the school board. Once the plan is adopted, the local jurisdictions that are out that are a part of the school district, in this case, city of Beaverton and Washington County, will then integrate the long range facility plan in their comprehensive plan. So there is a connection between the district's planning and the local uh, jurisdictional land use uh, and capital improvement planning. And that's a very important, and that's a requirement of ORS 195, 110, and it's a very valuable feature of, um, uh, of the planning process to ensure the coordination. Next slide, please, Jennifer. And of course, the plan ultimately will include identification of priorities for uh, future facilities and balance those needs with funding opportunities. Uh, the plan will look at additions to existing facilities, renovations, new schools or re replacement of existing schools like was done as was done in the previous bond and other, other support facilities such as the transportation center. The, the priorities will then be balanced with the financial needs and financial opportunities uh, in the district and um, included in the long range facility plan. So that's an overview of the long range facility plan. I, I'm gonna turn it back to Leroy and he will talk about uh, district goals. Great, thank you, Frank. Um, next slide, please. So we thought it was very, very important uh, to really establish a link, a strong connection between the objectives of the long range facility plan and the strategic goals or objectives of the district. And uh, because of that, we wanted to show you this slide, which really outlines sort of four key pillars, so to speak, um, of the district's strategic objectives. They include uh, the expectation for excellence, the concept of innovation related to schools and learning, making certain that equity and parity is embraced and included in all decision making, and really finding ways wherever possible to support collaboration. Next slide, please. In addition to referring back to these overarching goals established by the district, 
a set of guiding principles directly related to the long range facility plan were developed by the district. And these guiding principles are in alignment with the four key pillars that have been established previously by the district. So under the expectation of excellence, the long range facility plan should strategically plan for maintenance, modernization, and possibly replacement of facilities. It should allow the district to meet all state regulatory requirements. It should help the district and its community maintain and protect its current investment in facilities so that they don't degrade to a point where it becomes very problematic. It should consider uh, the benefit of the cost benefits of replacing a facility versus modernizing it and we're most efficient, uh, go ahead and replace facilities uh, if necessary. And of course it should uh, consider very carefully and provide for additions and expansions uh, if uh, justified by growth in certain portions of the district. Under innovation, uh, it should definitely recognize and support the evolving needs of the district and be as part of that, make sure that your school facilities are flexible for change. And it should also consider and respond to concepts associated with sustainability, energy efficiency, and of course, ease of maintenance and durability. Under equity, which Frank mentioned earlier, every decision that should be made within the long range facility plan must be viewed through the equity lens with the intention of working towards parity district wide across facilities and district wide for all students. And this would incorporate any upgrades and improvements and making sure that those upgrade and improvements are distributed in a fair fashion across the district. And from the standpoint of collaboration, make sure that the facility plan supports modernizations such that they will help the district uh, create collaborative environments for students, for staff and the community. And where appropriate to also include other community amenities within the plan. Next slide, please. Touching on the equity lens in a little bit more detail, um, we really do wanna recognize that this lens should be used to help guide decision-making. And there are a series of questions that can be asked associated with that, such as whose voice is and is not represent, represented in any of the decisions that are being made? Who does a decision benefit or burden? Is the decision that is being made in alignment with the general Beaverton School District equity policy? And does that decision close or widen access opportunity and expectation gaps amongst your students, staff, and community? Next slide, please. Moving on to a very, very brief bond history, um, focusing primarily on your most recent bond. Next slide, please. First, it's important, I think, to ask why do we need bond measures at all? What are they for and what role do they play uh, in the development of facilities? And one of the core elements to know or be aware of for those of you who may not be aware of it is there is a distinction between operational funds and capital project funds. And so uh, funds that are provided to the district uh, through community taxes associated with operations are not used um, for the maintenance, modernization, or replacement of facilities. It's only bond measures and other grant money coming from the state that is used for uh, capital improvements throughout your district. And again, the purpose of these bond measures, to reiterate, is at its root to make sure that your facilities are supporting your educational programs, that we are protecting your existing investment in facilities, and that we're able to accommodate enrollment, particularly in the event of areas in the district that are experiencing growth. Next slide, please. We wanted to show uh, just a few of the newer projects or brand new projects from your most recent 2014 bond, which was $680 million bond. 
Um, there were, of course, many other improvements made to facilities across the district, both in terms of additions and modernizations and dealing with deferred maintenance items. And the photographs that you see here in the list of projects are just a sample of the new projects that were added. And the point that we wanted to make here is that really your community has had a very solid and successful history passing bonds and making very, very important improvements and modernizations and maintenance of your existing facilities. And this long range plan and the potential for a forthcoming capital measure is just one more step in that successful history. Next slide, please. So now we move into one of the key areas of focus for tonight, which is really hopefully helping you develop uh, an understanding of district need in the three key areas that Frank made reference to earlier, educational program, enrollment and capacity, and facility condition. Next slide, please. So our first area, um, which has very purposely made the first area, involves educational program, because again, the facilities at their core uh, exist and should be modernized and repaired and replaced to support your programs. These will be all the orange slides that you're looking at this evening. The slide you're looking at uh, is a graphic representation of one way to measure educational adequacy in a given facility. Um, one common metric that is used uh, is taking a look at the gross square footage per student that is provided at a given facility. Uh, we take the square footage of each facility, divide it by the students to determine how many existing square feet there are, and then we com compare those uh, to a couple of different hurdle points or metrics. Um, we compare them to both national averages at each grade level, and really more importantly, we compare them to the Beaverton School District target square footage at each grade level as defined in the education specifications that the district has developed. So essentially that number represents what the district has established as the ideal square footage per student at a given grade level. And when they would build or construct a new school at that grade level, they would try and target that square footage per student. So you see the horizontal white lines that are dashed, they indicate at each grade level what that ed spec square footage per student is in Beaverton School District. And I would like you to pay particular attention to the blue bars on the far left hand side of the uh, education or the elementary grade level and also the blue bars in the high school level because these sites represent a significant uh, underage of square footage per student um, as seen below uh, the district's ed spec. So we're looking at more than 20 square feet per student below the target number. Next slide, please. From the standpoint of educational program and adequacy, um, there were some very specific projects that were identified along with the general metric of square footage per student. Um, I'm just going to touch very briefly on the first um, kind of bolded bullet point here. Um, the intention of this is just to give you an overall sense of if you were to bring the um, square footage of all facilities up to the district standard, which as represented by the ed spec, this represents an, uh, an estimate of the amount of capital required to do that. And I should say that um, this is only for reference because no district um, that we have ever worked with or known of um, sets out to achieve this, certainly not in one fell swoop. Um, this is something that might be achieved over a very long period of time, uh, a number of decades. Um, the line items below that top uh, item are specific educational areas above and beyond just the square footage per student. These were identified um, by the district teaching and learning group. They include special education, which is really looking at the idea of providing additions at 12 elementary schools, seven middle schools, and three high schools to align with district standards 
in the area of special education. It also includes the potential to modernize or create a standalone special education facility for the district. And you see there are varying costs associated with that, um, depending on which approach you would take. The second bullet point uh, is early childhood education. Um, and the intention here is to provide preschool classroom and support additions at eight elementary schools to provide preschool at all Title I schools. And the third uh, very specific programmatic area involves physical education, where a gymnasium or multi-purpose room additions would be added to 14 elementary, two middle, and one option school to meet the state PE requirements. Um, and finally, just for reference again, uh, the, if the district or the community felt that it was valuable or appropriate to consider removing portable classrooms, uh, and this is an issue oftentimes comes up in terms of um, the safety of students moving from satellite classrooms to the main building to use restrooms and other support facilities. Um, the number that you see there is a rough order of magnitude estimate on what would be involved in the removal of all portable classrooms across the district. Now, I want to be very clear with this slide that we are not saying that it is the intention of the district to do all of these line items to their full extent. What the intention of this slide is, is to merely identify the educational program need which areas that need resides in and what the total need and related cost is for each of the educational programs. Next slide, please. Viewing educational programs through the equity lens and specifically in this case, we're viewing it through greater than 50% free and reduced lunch, greater than 50% students of color and greater than 15% English language learners, the following sco schools emerge as areas or sites that might can, uh, be worth special consideration, particularly with regard um, to any modifications, modernizations, or changes that would be made there. And as you will note, both on the map, so those, those are identified by the red colored dots and also the yellow colored dots with the red circles around them. And as you'll note, there are already three schools that fall within this category when viewed through the equity lens that have been replaced. And so the district is well on its way um, towards addressing school facilities and certainly considering um, the order in which they're addressed through the equity lens. Next slide, please. Finally, uh, under educational program, there are a few takeaways that we'd like to leave you with, which are really just summarizing the previous slides. It's important to remember that there are eight elementary schools and two high schools that are significantly below the square footage targets that have been established by the district in their education specifications. There are three known areas of facility improvement that could better support programs, educational programs across the district. These again have been identified by the teaching and learning group. They include preschool or pre-K programs, special education and physical education. And finally, there are nine elementary schools, two middle schools and one high school that emerge when viewed through the lens of free and reduced lunch, students of color and English language learners. Next slide, please. The second area of consideration, so the blue slides, uh, involves facility condition. And when we look at existing condition of facilities, um, there are a number of facets that really need to be considered. And there's a tremendous amount of data that has been developed uh, as part of a highly detailed facility assessment uh, that was conducted in 2020. Frank Angelo made reference to that um, study earlier. One of the high level uh, facets that we look at when considering facilities is their age. Um, and so like any 
building or any automobile or really anything out there in the world, um, there is an expected life cycle um, for facilities. That expected life cycle will vary and change on a district by district basis. Some districts establish uh, a life cycle of 60 years as an expected life cycle. Others may establish 80 years as an expected life, si life cycle. For purposes of this long range plan, the district has identified around 75 years as what would be an expected life cycle for a building. And that's not to say that that's a hard and fast number. It's just a zone where you may start paying particular attention to particular sites due to their age. And what you see here in this is there, that there are three elementary schools in the district that are above the 70 or past the 75 year expected life cycle. McKay Elementary, which is 91 years old, Barnes Elementary at 93, and Raleigh Hills, which is also 93 years old. At the high school level, there's one high school that exceeds 75 years. It is your, the large portions of it, not all of it, but the large portions of it are your oldest facility in the district at 105 Beaverton High School. And then one of your options programs, Terra Nova, also exceeds the 75 year expected life cycle at 82 years old. Next slide, please. One of the key areas coming out of the facility assessment uh, is a index rating that is developed. This is an industry standard index rating called facility condition index. And what this index represents is the ratio uh, of cost related to the repair of all deficiencies on a given site relative to the replacement cost of the building as is on that site. And so the higher the bar you see on this chart, the higher the number, it means that, that the worse the condition of the facility. And so you see the lighter blue bar across the top, which is identified as critical area, consider replacement. You will note that there are several of the blue bars that extend into that area, including seven elementary schools, West Tualatin View, Cooper Mountain, Fir Grove, Beaver Acres, Raleigh Park, Cedar Mill, and Raleigh Hills K-8 all fall into that zone. Of the middle schools, when middle school Whitford uh, starts to move just into that zone for consideration of replacement. And Beaverton High School is the only high school that per facility condition index falls into that uh, potential replacement category. Option schools are Terra Nova and ISB, and there are two transportation facilities uh, in your support buildings that fall into that category, the transportation facility at Allen and the facility at South. Uh, I do wanna stress here that just because these buildings fall into this consider replacement category does not mean that you necessarily have to replace them. It's merely flagging them for that consideration with the intent of having an open discussion and really trying to establish what the most efficient, cost efficient and appropriate way to manage that facility is. Next slide, please. A third facet considered uh, relative to facility condition involves its seismic condition. Uh, across the top of this chart, you see the district's goal for uh, seismic at each of the sites, which is uh, termed a damage control range. The higher the bar on this chart, uh, the better condition the facility is. Uh, so you will note, for example, that your new schools, SATA, VOS, and so forth, uh, are well into and actually above the damage control range. That's because the uh, newer building codes uh, require a level of seismic um, structure that takes them to that level. What the intention of this slide is, is to show you those facilities that you should really be paying attention to with regard to being under uh, that district goal or target uh, for seismic condition, particularly with regard to the blue bars. Um, these sites fall into the lowest category 
um, which is termed less than collapse prevention. And you'll note that there are four elementary schools that fall into this low category. They include Raleigh Hills K-8, Fir Grove, McKay, and Raleigh Park at the elementary levels. At the middle school levels, Mountain View, Cedar Park, Highland Park, and Whitford fall below, into the below collapse pre prevention. Beaverton High School at the high school level is the only facility that falls into this low category. And ISB in your options group of schools also falls into this category. Next slide, please. We wanted to uh, share this slide with you for a couple of reasons. Um, first, to let you know that behind uh, all of the numbers that you're seeing here in this evening's presentation are uh, really a high level of detail that's been developed uh, through the facility assessment that was conducted in 2020 by another third party consultant. Um, it really looks at the costs associated with facilities, um, not only the total costs, but also the 10 year costs related to deferred maintenance, modernization and so forth. Coming out of that facility assessment, it was determined that the total deficiencies across the district from the standpoint of deferred maintenance uh, are on the order of approximately $610 million. These would include uh, deficiencies in structural systems, mechanical and electrical systems, exterior enclosure, sometimes known as building envelope, and interior finishes, commercial equipment. So for example, kitchen equipment would fall into that category, fire and life safety systems, and site work, which would include things like parking lots, sidewalks, site lighting, and so forth. Next slide, please. And finally, the last facet we're gonna share with you this evening that we look at regarding facility condition is often called EUI, which stands for energy use intensity. The intention of this chart is to try and identify which facilities um, offer the best return on investment uh, with regard to improvements you might make and their impact on energy efficiency. So the higher the bars here in this slide, the greater opportunity you would have to improve their energy efficiency. So between uh, four, level four and five, you see a series of blue bars, which include Raleigh Hills K-8, McKay, McKinley, Cedar Mill, Shoals Heights, Montclair, and Cooper Mountain at the elementary level, at the middle school level, Mountain View and Five Oaks, and at the high school level, Beaverton High School, and Terra Nova options, and several of your transportation facilities, the administrative building and the maintenance center would all fall into uh, this category of high return on investment uh, for energy efficiency. Next slide, please. The takeaways for this section are when viewed through the metrics of age, facility condition, seismic condition, and energy use, so the four facets, facets that we have shared with you, two schools consistently fall into the worst category in all four areas, Raleigh Hills K-8 and Beaverton High School. Four elementary schools, four middle schools, one high school and one alternative school fall into the worst seismic category, which is below collapse prevention. And district-wide deferred maintenance is estimated at $610 million. And with regard to this last point, I do want to point out and stress that uh, the expectation would not be to say that any district, and this happens in, in every situation, would ever undertake to address and repair the entire deferred maintenance list across the district. It's usually taken on uh, as a proportion of the total. We're only showing you this number here so that you understand um, what the plan proposals are getting at relative to the total need. Next slide, please. The final area we are gonna look at in terms of the need uh, is enrollment and capacity. As Frank mentioned, um, the district uh, collaborates with Portland State University Center for Population Research um, to develop 
uh, 10-year uh, enrollment projections um, that are used as the basis for the long-range facility plan. Uh, these enrollment projections are both district-wide and also on a site-by-site -site basis. Next slide, please. These maps that you're looking at uh, represent only growth and decline within the district. They are not looking at the capacity of schools. So this is the number of, of students that over the next 10 to 12 year period um, via projection would be expected to either grow the district or cause decline. Uh, at the elementary enrollment level, um, I think it's very important to note that there is a 6% enrollment reduction district-wide um, that is projected, uh, which would mean that you would have approximately 1,000 students less than you currently have at the elementary level. Having said that, there are a couple of boundary areas, uh, Sato and also Hazeldale, which are projected as having some very significant growth. So Sato is projected as having a 26.9% growth and Hazeldale 38.7% growth. The middle school enrollment projection, uh, it's showing a 3% reduction district-wide or approximately 230 less students uh, at the end of the 10-year period. There's one exception um, that shows up uh, relative to district-wide decline. Whitford is shown as an increase of approximately 5%. Under high school enrollment, there's a projection of a 5.9% reduction, which is 635 students less at the end of a 10-year period. There are two boundaries, however, which are shown as potentially growing. Westview with a growth rate of 8.3% and Mountainside at 3.4%. Next slide, please. These maps then sort of land the plane, so to speak. We're really starting to look at school utilization, which is comparing the projected enrollment at the end of the 10-year period to your current capacity to try and understand where you might be over capacity or where you have adequate capacity. So at the elementary level, district-wide, you can see that you will have at the end of the 10-year period, 12.8% remaining permanent capacity. So you will have approximately 2,500 seats available district-wide uh, at the elementary level. There are, however, several boundary areas that will be over capacity. And I would like to direct your attention to the brightest red uh, boundary areas, which would be Bonnie Slope and Sato. Sato is expected to be 174 students over capacity. Bonnie Slope is projected as being 126 students over capacity. At the middle school level, uh, you are projected as having about 3% remaining in your permanent capacity or 240 seats available district-wide. However, Stoller at the top of the map um, is projected as having a pretty significant over-enrollment of 537 students at the end of the 10-year period. At the high school level, 14.7% remaining capacity has been projected, uh, which represents approximately 1,700 available seats district-wide. However, Westview uh, is shown as being relatively significantly over capacity at 588 students. Next slide, please. So the takeaways related to enrollment capacity are, that there is district-wide capacity at every grade level. So when you take a snapshot of the entire district, you have plenty of capacity. However, there are two elementary schools that are projected to be more than 100 students over capacity as individual boundary areas, Sato Elementary School and Bonnie Slope Elementary School. 
one of your middle schools is projected to be more than 500 students over capacity, Stoller Middle School, and one high school is projected to be almost 600 students over its capacity, Westview High School. Next slide. So with that, we've kind of given you a very high level summary of the three key need areas. And we would like to take the next 10 minutes or so and uh, allow you to ask any questions or have any comments uh, regarding the information you've seen. What I'd like to encourage you to do is to actually, um, it's best we've found if we can do this audibly, um, you can do that by uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a hand icon, which you can click on that and raise your hand and we will acknowledge you and unmute you so that you can ask your question. You can also ask questions through the chat, um, although it's much more difficult to kind of track that, but that, that is available to you as well, and we are tracking that. So with that, I'd like to open the floor, and if anyone would like to raise their hand and ask a question, we would love to answer. Yes, Steve. One, one clarification to our audience, um, this section is about identifying our need and identifying our issues. The next section is talking about um, potential solutions. So um, if you have questions about things, great, um, but also recognize that we will be getting into um, some possible um, solutions to our, our needs. Thank you for that clarification, Steve, yeah. We'll kind of uh, give you an opportunity to think about what you've seen a bit before we move on. We know this is a tremendous amount of information to try and absorb <laughs> when, when sitting. And, and we can go back to certain screens if you would like to see them again to um, you know stimulate any questions that you might have. Mm -hmm. Let's give it another 30 seconds or so, just in case to let people kind of think about. This is encouraging. Hopefully it's relatively clear as we presented it. <laughs> okay, why don't we move on to the um, plan proposal section. And at the end of the plan proposal section, we have a longer period of time uh, where you can ask questions or provide comments. And you can certainly, um, if, if uh, need related questions uh, in any of those three categories come to mind, you can certainly ask those during that Q&A period as well. So let's move on to the long range facility plan proposals that the district has developed um, as a way to address uh, certain areas of need that have been identified. Next slide, please. So as we mentioned earlier, we'll be looking at two different plan proposals um, that have been developed by the district. Uh, the first plan proposal option one um, represents no tax rate increase. So again, as a basis, remember that um, the primary way that district and your community can address uh, issues associated with your facility, capital related issues, is through the passage of a capital measure or bond measure. And so as any uh, plan is developed that involves capital, we always wanna make sure that we do that within an understanding of what the tax implication would be, because that's very important um, from the standpoint of developing support and really understanding um, from your perspective as a community member, what makes the most sense and what doesn't make sense to you. So plan option one represents no tax rate increase. Uh, it maintains the current tax rate um, and the bond yield coming out of that is projected to be approximately $325 million that can be applied uh, to modernization, replacement, or repair of your facilities. 
And the expectation is that this $325 million would be spent over roughly a four-year bond program um, or time frame. Uh, some of you may be asking, how can we get $325 million with no tax rate increase? And the answer to that is that the district has um, several uh, different types of debt uh, sort of ongoing and moving along through the system. And some of that debt is sunsetting. It's coming off the books essentially. And so um, as that debt uh, sunsets, it provides an opportunity to essentially um, fill the bucket back up, so to speak, and maintain the same tax rate with no increase. And this is a very common strategy or approach that communities take and districts take. Uh, to time um, their capital measures or bond measures um, with long range plans and the modernization uh, of their facilities. The second plan option looks at uh, about a 25 cent tax rate increase per thousand dollars of assessed property value. Um, that bond amount is projected as yielding seven, approximately $725 million. And that would be spent over about a seven year bond program timeframe. So construction over the course of approximately seven years. This second plan option was identified um, because it is very similar in bond amount uh, to your previous bond measure, which was 680 million. So we're looking at a little bit of escalation, um, you know, so which kicks that amount up. But suffice to say, this is relatively similar to your last phase of work. And so we'll take a look now at these two plan options and some of the details within each one of them. Next slide, please. So when we compare the two plan options side by side, uh, you can see various allocations in each of the kind of key need areas that we have been uh, presenting so far. The first area is educational program. Uh, you'll note that both plan options um, make allocations for improvements to your special education programs throughout the district. You also see that both plan options provide a modest allocation for uh, modifications to your pre-K programs in the district. The larger program takes another step forward and provides an allocation for outdoor learning improvements. And we'll define in a little bit more detail in a moment what each of these mean so, so you can understand them after you've seen where the allocations are. And all, the larger uh, bond proposal also provides for uh, additions of physical education space associated with the, the district. The second area of need, which is facility condition, is really broken into two components. The first component uh, involves several sites where the condition of them, uh, sort of the advanced deterioration of them, was determined as meriting potential replacement rather than continued modernization. And that's primarily due to the fact that to bring those facilities up, um, the cost for the modernization was uh, relatively high um, when considered in view of a replacement cost. The replacement facilities that are currently being proposed include Raleigh Hills Elementary School replacement in both options and Beaverton High School replacement uh, in the first option, the lower option, the $20 million you see is associated with all the pre-planning design and essentially positioning that project to be in the next uh, subsequent uh, phase of work. Uh, the actual construction because of the smaller bond amount would not be in this phase of work. It's only pre-planning uh, pre construction and setting, setting everything up. The larger plan option uh, would include the replacement of that school. Um, now I would point out here that there are some newer components that were built in that school, which would 
be uh, maintained, um, but essentially the entire school would be a new school. Uh, the second plan option also provides an allocation uh, for a second elementary school replacement study. So this is not replacing a second elementary school. It's conducting a study uh, uh, to prepare for a subsequent bond measure in the future um, to try and determine what would make the most sense for the next elementary school replacement in the future. And then finally, uh, the fourth replacement proposal is for Allen Street transportation replacement, and that occurs in both um, the lower and the higher proposal. From the standpoint of modernizations and um, dealing with deferred maintenance and other deterioration in the district, deferred maintenance allocations uh, on the lower uh, bond amount are $110 million and they're increased in the higher bond amount to 140 million. School modernizations are $10 million in the lower plan option and approximately three times that amount in the higher plan option. Seismic upgrades are $20 million in the $325 million option and a little over double that in the higher plan option two and security upgrades are $6 million and $15 million respectively. Nutrition services, each plan proposal has an allocation of $5 million. So with regard to this, I wanna point out, particularly in view of the facility condition modernization category, you can now start to get a sense of how large a portion of deferred maintenance is being addressed by these proposals relative to the total projected amount of $610 million. So you can get a rough percentage and understand that. Our third area of need, this capacity enrollment component, um, there is an equal provision in both plans for the addition of classrooms at certain facilities that are projected as being over enrolled uh, within their current boundary lines. And then you'll note at the bottom, there are several other uh, support line items, including uh, improvements in technology district wide, a school office relocation, bus replacement, and replacement of critical equipment throughout the district. Next slide, please. We wanted to give you uh, a very high level um, description of uh, the allocations and why, what the intention is and, and why they are, have been included in the plans. For the, the first area of need, educational programs under special education improvements, the intention is to adapt existing special education spaces such that they are more suitable for their current use and better support students' needs in those special education programs. Uh, in, for the second area uh, under educational program, uh, pre-K modifications, the intention is to upgrade existing pre-kindergarten spaces to meet the unique needs of young learners. The outdoor learning improvements that are included in the larger option two are intended to expand outdoor covered play areas at elementary schools across the district. And the phys physical education programmatic modifications that are included in the higher option two plan are intended to build a new gym at Stoller Middle School and Barnes Elementary School and provide some improvement to other district athletic facilities. So I should be clear here that these improvements to each of the programs do not address the full need that was identified in each of these programmatic areas. You can see by the plan proposals that uh, striking a balance between a reasonable yet to be determined by you as a community member uh, amount to be proposed for a bond measure and need has sort of landed on a particular percentage uh, being tackled under each of these program areas. 
Next slide, please. When we look at facility replacement and we ask ourselves why Raleigh Hills Elementary School, why has that been selected for replacement? Um, if we look at some of the previous information that we shared from the standpoint of need, particularly under facility condition, um, you will see that, and the charts illustrate this on the right-hand side of the slide with Raleigh Hills being highlighted in the red. Uh, Raleigh Hills uh, is the worst FCI score uh, in the district. It's in the most critical condition. It is also one of the oldest facilities in the district um, and certainly one of the top three oldest at the elementary grade level being 93 years old. Uh, it is one of four elementary schools with a seismic rating below collapse prevention. And it is also a facility with an EUI score of five, which means that improvements made in that facility will yield the highest return on investment from the standpoint of energy efficiency improvements. In addition to that, more than 45% of students at Raleigh Hills are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Its existing capacity is 250 below the district target of 750, which means the construction of a larger facility there would provide opportunity for a higher utilization of that site. It was also previously identified as the next priority in the previous bond plan. So the, the previous long range facility plan of 2010 and its uh, associated capital measure of 2014. And the replacement of it will eliminate approximately $12 million of deferred maintenance need off of the long list of de uh, deferred maintenance district-wide. Next slide, please. So Beaverton High School, um, why has it been proposed as a potential replacement? Uh, again, taking a look at the facility condition itself, Beaverton High School is one of the worst FCI scores in the district. And from the standpoint of high school, uh, the high school grade level, uh, it is the only school that falls into the worst category. It is the oldest facility in the district um, with the majority of the existing building being 105 years old and therefore likely reaching or having exceeded what would be an expected life cycle for the facility. It is the only high school with a seismic rating below collapse prevention and also has an EUI score of five, which provides the greatest opportunity for return on investment uh, relative to energy efficiency. 51% of its students are eligible for free and reduced lunch. And by replacing the facility, it will eliminate or take off the books approximately $53 million of deferred maintenance need. Next slide, please. Why the, the proposed replacement of Allen Street Transportation Facility? Uh, referring again to condition, uh, it is one of the worst FCI scores in the district and falls under the category of critical condition. The existing facility is more than 50 years old, which doesn't necessarily make it one of the older facilities in the district. There are certainly others that are older. However, some of the specific uh, activities or operational needs of the district, um, it was determined really should be addressed, namely, that the repair bays in the transportation facility are very cramped and they lack space for modern uh, repair equipment. One third of the floor lifts in the facility are unusable due to failed parts and age. Um, and there are some very significant concerns about lifting vehicles um, and being able to safely uh, conduct maintenance on the facilities. Next slide, please. From the standpoint of modernization and capacity enrollment, so we're really combining the last two categories of need under this uh, sort of why or, or rationalization. Uh, for deferred maintenance, um, the intention is to really repair and upgrade 
upgrade projects at all facilities with exception of the brand new facilities. And of course, that's because the brand new facilities have very little to low deferred maintenance needs. I do want to qualify here that um, repairing and upgrading at all facilities does not mean repair and upgrading everything. Again, we're only looking at um, the line items at each site that are in the most need. So we're not replacing everything or repairing everything, only a portion of the need relative to deferred maintenance. Under school modernization, the idea is to modernize certain schools to improve the learning environment and enhance student engagement, as well as improve the health of the facility, uh, allowing the health of the students to be better within the existing facility and also their behavior by opening it up, um, bringing more light in, a more pleasant environment. Seismically, the intention with the allocations is to provide seismic upgrade and bring it to the district target level for those worst performing buildings, uh, particularly the ones that are not anticipated to be replaced um, within either this bond measure or, the, or a subsequent immediately subsequent bond measure. Security upgrades, the intention is to provide cameras, fencing, and other access control upgrades at schools throughout the district. Nutrition services, um, this would be involve various kitchen and kitchen equipment upgrades throughout the district. And classroom additions would again be adding classrooms at Sato Elementary School, Oak Hills Elementary School, and Stoller Middle School to address the projected uh, over-enrollment within those boundary areas as they are currently defined. Next slide. So we wanted to give you one quick repeat look at the two plan options side by side before we open up a question and answer to let you uh, reacquaint yourself with the two plans. And I'll just let you kind of look down the list. And uh, again, if any of your questions need to refer back to any one of these slides, we're very happy uh, to go back into the presentation and pull up the slide that uh, you might be interested in uh, commenting about or asking a question on. So why don't we move to the next slide then? And we have uh, allocated about 20 minutes of time or so uh, for any questions or points you would like to share with us. We're hoping to receive uh, anything as, as community members you may be able to provide. Again, at the bottom of your screen, um, please use the hand icon, icon to raise your hand so that we can recognize you and unmute you. I'll give you a few minutes to think about it. I know there's a tremendous amount of material here to try and process. Um, and then in a few minutes, if we don't have any uh, questions, we can just move into the six targeted questions and uh, have you answer those for us. Not seeing any hands raised and not seeing anything typed into the chat. I'm going to go ahead and move us into the final section, um, which is a very brief six question on the fly poll, so to speak. Next slide. And I'll give you instructions on how we'd like you to answer these questions. It's relatively simple. We would like to have you answer these questions in the chat. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, for those of you who may not be familiar, um, you can move your mouse down to the bottom of the screen and you'll see a chat icon. You can click on that and it will open 
the chat box and at the bottom of the chat box, you can type in a response. What we'd like you to do is first start with the question by just typing in the number one so we can track the response relative to each question very more easily. So you'll type in the number one and then answer these kind of two related questions. Should the district consider implementing the next phase of the long range plan by proposing a capital measure in 2021? Could also be early 2022 for that matter, but really the bottom line question is should they consider implementing the next phase of the long range facility plan by proposing a capital measure? And we'll give you three or four minutes um, for each of these questions. And I will give you a 30 second sort of warning as we get to the end of that three or four minute period. Okay, so we'll give it maybe 30 more seconds or so. Okay, let's move on to the second question. So again, first begin by typing in the number two. And the question, one of the two plans that we've presented this evening, which of these, uh, if any, would you support and why? Option one at 325 million or option two at 722. And if you don't support either, you can type that in as well, certainly. So the number two and then your answer. Okay, we'll give it 30 seconds more. Okay, why don't we move on to the third question of six questions.
begin by typing the number three. And the question is of the need that is being addressed, the different kinds of need in each of the proposals, do you see anything that is missing from the proposals? Something that should be included that isn't there. And if you don't see anything, you can just say no. Leroy, you're on mute. Thank you. Let's move on to question four. So please type in the number four. Do you see anything in the pro proposals that should not be included? So is there something there in the proposal that you think doesn't belong in the proposal? for whatever reason. It could be because you, the need is not um, a priority, or it could be that there is a, um, could be a political or a support issue associated with a given line item that has been proposed, any number of reasons. So something that you feel should not be included that's in the plan right now. Let's give this one another 30 seconds. Okay, let's move on to question five, please. So please type in the number five. And what we would like you to do with this question, you see a list of um, different um, need areas, so to speak, uh, eight different need areas. Um, and what we would like you to do after you've typed in the question number five is to identify your top three priorities by typing in the letter of that priority. For example, if for you, uh, let's say Raleigh Hills Elementary School was your number one priority, you would type in five and then B. And if technology was your next priority, you would type in H. And if the high school was your third priority, you'd type in D. So the number and just three letters in descending priority.
So we'll give this another 30 seconds. Okay, let's move on to our last question, number six. So please type in the number six. And this is really just a question about basic demographic information, but we have two questions for you under six. Um, one is if you could just let us know what school or schools or community you are most closely affiliated with. And also let us know what your relationship to the district is. So. Are you a current parent or have you had children in the district previously or maybe a staff member or some combination of those things? Just gives us a feel of who has participated. So we'll give us another 30 seconds and then we can wrap up. Okay, I think maybe the last slide here is. All right, that wraps up the presentation this evening. Um, again, I would like to thank you very much on behalf of all the, the entire planning team for taking time out of your busy schedules to attend this presentation. We know that it's a tremendous amount of information to try and absorb and understand in one sitting and uh, we appreciate you sticking with it. Um, to give you a really quick overview of what our next steps are, um, we will take this information and information coming out of our uh, previous two uh, public outreach open houses um, and kind of process what we have heard um, from various community members. And then we will have discussions internally uh, to determine um, what any impacts uh, the conversation, questions, suggestions may have on plan proposals. Uh, we will then take that information and including your commentary to the 12 person focus group that we have been working with so that they understand what the broader community has provided in terms of commentary. Um, they will provide us some additional input and information, I'm sure. And then we will draft, begin to draft a uh, report uh, that encapsulates uh, not only the information that you've seen this evening, but also a much higher level of detail information um, along with the plan proposals. This will be um, presented to the superintendent for consideration uh, and commentary. Uh, and we will uh, then write a final report this will ultimately go to the school board for consideration and uh, hopefully ultimately adoption. 
Um, so with that, I think I'm going to pass it off to Steve, who probably would like to have a few closing words as well. Thank you. So um, on behalf of the school board, on behalf of Superintendent Grotting, and not the least uh, on behalf of our panel here this evening, thank you so much for um, participating and being a part of this. Um, I want to assure you this is not the um, last time you will be hearing about this, nor is it the last time that you will um, have an opportunity to participate and comment on our plan. So uh, myself and other staff are going out to community uh, group meetings, PTO meetings and the like. Um, it's nowhere near as detailed as uh, what we did here this evening, but um, you know, if you have some time and want to um, get a presentation with your PTO, um, please uh, feel free to um, join those meetings and, um, you know, you can show off how much you learned in front of the PTO uh, members um, by asking some very deep and stimulating questions. So anyway, um, thank you very much. And with that, we are adjourned.